Welcome back to Old School Sports and our Out of the Park Baseball 24 playthrough of the Buffalo Wings. And we have made it just past the midway point of the 2040 season. It has been an excellent season for our Buffalo Wings, a 60-22 and 22 record, eight and a half games up on the Phillies in the National League East. And we've got the best record in baseball here. 80 games away from the end of the season. We did our annual mid-season review in our last episode, as well as the 2040 draft. So the focus for this episode is going to be on what, if anything, we actually do as the trade deadline approaches to maximize the chances that this win-now team actually is able to win now when we get to the postseason. Because although we do have two championships in the last six years, we have three straight first series playoff exits with a two and eight record in our last 10 playoffs games since we won our second championship. So we've got to not just continue to be good in this po regular season, but set this team up for some postseason success. And I talked about uh, a couple of the potential levers that we might look to push at the end of the last episode. One was the outfielder, Mike Broaden. One was the utility infielder, Mr. Goodwin. And last, and the one that generated the most conversation in the comment section of the previous episode, was our first baseman, Mike Heiner. And we'll talk through Mr. Heiner very shortly, but first I did want to highlight something new that I have noticed. We've got three of the top ten prospects in baseball at this point. I uh, may remember we signed Juan Toledo in 2038 as a... Uh, excellent young prospect through international amateur free agency at the age of 17. He's made his debut in rookie ball this year. Has not been particularly effective, but uh, we're not really expecting that. Just trying to get him as much seasoning and as much coaching as early as possible. Alejandro Contreras, who we traded for this offseason, uh, gave up about the number 40 prospect in baseball, Guadalupe Amedqua, for Mr. Contreras. And still think that Contreras could help us at the major league level before the end of this year. He did well in AA Albany, hitting 294 with 22 homers and 194 at-bats. But he has been somewhat overmatched over the last couple of weeks since he was promoted to AAA Albany, hitting just a buck 47 with 14 strikeouts and 34 at bats. Still trying to get him as uh, diversified and trained up as possible to play as many positions as possible in the infield. Unfortunately, with our latest scouting, we think his range in the infield is a 60. We used to think it was a 65. So that is not optimal, but still think he could be a pretty useful infielder with his combination of a good glove and a potentially very good bat if he fully develops. And then last but not least, Jim Lance, who was a second round pick of ours in 2036, 71st overall, uh, is now viewed as the number 10 prospect in all, in base, all of baseball. Uh, the 22-year-old Pitched only six games in double A at the end of last year, but he was pretty effective, so we promoted him to triple A where he's gone eight and four with a four thirty eight ERA, above average ERA plus and fit minus two point four war. Still think he's got a fair amount of development that needs to happen. Certainly could be a September call up, um, similar to Contreras, but I could see a scenario where Contreras actually ends up on our playoff roster. Uh, with the fact that we've got a couple of infielders that we're not thrilled with, whereas even if Lance comes up in September, uh, given the quality of our pitching staff, I would be surprised if he made a postseason roster for us this year. 
And before we start visiting trades, we decided it wouldn't be a bad time to uh, check in on Mr. Amezqua, who was uh, the one of the prizes of our system in a, I don't want to say the cornerstone of the trade uh, for Contreras, because we had to give up so many people that uh, it's hard to call one of them a cornerstone, but certainly Amezqua was the highest rated prospect we gave up, and it looks like he's not viewed as a top 100 prospect anymore. Uh, he's closing in on 24 years old. Uh, he's still in A ball. Has gotten the batting average up to 261 this year, 119 WRC plus. Uh, would certainly think if he was in my organization, I'd probably promote him to high A ball. Certainly looks like he could be uh, competitive at that level. But not our issue anymore. Uh, we've got to ensure that uh, Mr. Contreras plays uh, better in triple A ball than he has been and uh, potentially is a guy who can help us towards the end of this season. And as I mentioned, the three players on our offense that we are most interested in potentially trying to upgrade from in the next month, uh, one is Mike Broaden, the 27-year-old outfielder, hitting 243 this year. He's been a league average type player. Uh, that said, when you look at a batting profile that suggests a guy who's a slightly above average offensive player and a good glove that can play anywhere in the outfield, plus a left-handed hitter with a um, favorable split, and we try to play him primarily against right-handed pitching, have to acknowledge that his three years in Buffalo have been disappointing. Um, at this point, he's got a 92 WRC plus, and he's averaging, you know, less than a win and a half above replacement over those three, closing in on three years that we've had him on the team. But I still hold out some hope that he'll be productive this year. He probably does have the most trade value, as some of you have noted of these players. But I also think he's probably the best of these three players at this point and they're actually all named Mike I know I called uh, Goodwin Mr. Goodwin when I was talking about him earlier in the episode because I was like are they really all named Mike the three guys that I'm thinking about moving on from and they are uh, Mike Goodwin signed him to a one-year deal with a team option for next year that uh, if he's still on our roster at the end of this season will almost certainly be declining. He's hit a buck 86 this year, um, only seven for 11 on the base paths, 43 WRC plus closing it on a win below replacement um, is a utility infielder for us. Uh, he's done a pretty poor job. We do like his influence in the clubhouse, uh, but certainly a guy that, um, when I was talking about Mr. Contreras earlier having a chance to be on our playoff roster, it's very conceivable to me that uh, if it came down to a Contreras versus Goodwin for the playoff roster in October, that uh, Contreras could get that spot over Goodwin, given that he's certainly higher quality defensively. And even though he's been struggling in AAA, when I look at his profile, it's hard for me to imagine that he would hit worse than Mr. Goodwin has for us this year. And then last but not least, there is Mike Heiner. And his overall batting profile at this point, uh, closing in on 31 years old, is pretty average. Still is a uh, adept base stealer and base runner. And you can see that he hasn't been caught stealing over the past two and a half seasons in the majors. Doesn't run a ton because his speed is not that good, but uh, very selective when he does it. But his range is, and his overall defensive skills are pretty mediocre at first base and pretty mediocre in the outfield. And he has admittedly um, been below average last year and bad this year. But when I look at Heiner's ratings against right-handed pitching, part of me, and since he's basically just starting against right-handed pitching at this point, part of me, when I look at the 
245 batting average and 275 on base percentage this year thinks that he's just gotten unlucky. Now the argument against that is that his BABIP has actually improved a lot from where it was a year ago and is only 10 points below his career mark, but he's still been kind of brutal. So the argument that we may need to move on from Heiner, I get. Uh, he is kind of the latest version of Jace Barofin, who uh, those of you who have watched this series from the start may remember was uh, the first first round draft pick for these Buffalo Wings. Came up to the majors at a relatively young age and was really good his first few years, kind of became an average player, and then we moved on from him um, despite the fact that we had signed him to a long-term contract when he was very young that we thought was a good contract. And Heiner's really followed a similar route. We drafted him uh, with our first-round pick in 2032. He made it to the majors um, the start of the next year, and we signed him to a, I believe it was a 10-year contract at the time before he had ever played a game in the majors where we were going to be paying him more than he would have made for his minimum salary years in his first couple of arbitration years, but probably less than he would have made in his later arbitration and free agent years. And you can see we're up to $8 million on his contract at this point, uh, $9 million next year, $10 million the season after that, and then a team option for his age 33 season at $12 million. So a contract that's been pretty good for us is now getting to the stages where since his performance has dipped, uh, he definitely is not a, an easy player to trade or a particularly um, valuable player on the trade market. You can see here looking at Mr. Heiner and shopping him now. The Nashville Stars will offer us... Um, a middle reliever for him, which would get his contract off the books, but would not uh, fix our issues at first base. So his trade value is minimal. But back to Mr. Heiner. Um, Sakruth, um, who's someone who I enjoy his insights in the comments, um, I think was a little harsh on how Heiner has performed for us um, in recent years. Um, and certainly over the course of his career, Heiner has been a good player. Uh, was a consistent guy who was one of our team leaders in homers and ribbies um, for the first six years of his career. Still was one of our top guys driving in runs a year ago, uh, even though he became a below average offensive player. And unfortunately this year, he's just continued to regress. So the point that Heiner is not what he used to be, uh, I definitely agree with. Um, the argument that um, Heiner has been a less valuable player than Joe Gallagher, who we disposed of this past off season, um, I don't agree with, though. And we'll just pop in and view what Mr. Gallagher did for us and what he's doing this year. Because although my point was that Gallagher with a 109, 110, and 76 WRC plus uh, his last three seasons in Buffalo was, by the numbers, a less productive offensive player than Heiner. Gallagher is actually having a um, resurgent-ish year for himself uh, this year with Nashville. 115 WRC plus hitting 232, 21 homers and 246 at bats. So Gallagher is outperforming Heiner this year. Um, but as I noted in the comments to the last episode, um, as soon as Gallagher was off of his minimum contract, given that he is a feast or famine slugger with a bad personality, no speed, and a poor defensive player. Uh, there was no way I was going to bring him back. And even though Gallagher has been better this year for Nashville, I still think that moving on from him was addition by subtraction. Um, the issue is that Heiner has not bounced back the way that I would have hoped. 
And I do have to face the reality that for the last year and a half, we've had a first baseman who's been a well below average offensive player who's not that good defensively. And we're somehow 60 and 22 with a player like that in our lineup. But if there's a way for us to finally move on from Mr. Heiner, I think that's something that we do need to strongly consider doing because hopefully it'll make us better this year. And most importantly, it'll get us out of his seasons in his early to mid thirties where we could be really overpaying him for what he's become. If he was still kind of the 114 WRC plus player that he's been over the course of his career, then we probably would be okay paying him that kind of money. But with the fact that he's had a 285 and a 275 on base percentage these last couple seasons in the majors, and when we look at what our scout thinks from him, his contact, his power are trending in the wrong direction. It's hard for me to imagine that all of a sudden, as he gets further into his 30s, he's going to bounce back. So, um, well, I don't think Gallagher was the right guy to have playing first baseman, first base for us um, instead of Heiner. I think I do accept the premise that it's probably time to see if we can put a deal together to move on from Mr. Heiner and upgrade this year and also get that contract, which isn't potentially crippling, but is potentially a bad contract off of our books for the next couple of years after this one before uh, we would get to the option year. And as luck would have it, I do have a deal to trade Mr. Heiner away that has been accepted. So I'm going to walk through that transaction with you here so you can let me know what you think of it. Um, I'm still not 100% sure as I start walking through this with you whether I'm going to accept this or not, even though I did propose it to them and they came back and said, we'll do it. But uh, I'll be deciding that in the next five minutes or so. So um, you won't be able to help me make this decision, but I trust that some of you will let me know whether or not you liked it. So in addition to getting rid of Heiner, which we've talked about, uh, we're going to be sending the minor league designated hitter Kevin McGaffigan. Tenth round pick five years ago. Looks like he could be a fourth or fifth outfielder. Um, only in high A ball this year and certainly not tearing it up there. So don't mind giving getting rid of him. Uh, minor league reliever Bobby Trudgeon. 17th round pick in 2037. Hard to see him having a future at the major league level. And then minor league left fielder Javara Ainsworth, who was a third round pick, uh, 21 year old who hasn't made it out of rookie ball for us. Um, looks like he could hit an occasional homer. He could draw an occasional walk. Uh, but not a lot of speed, not real good defensively. Another guy who looks like a fourth or fifth outfielder. So those three guys plus Mr. Heiner and the player that we're going to get in return or potentially get in return would be the left fielder Luis Coma Duran from the San Francisco Giants, um, who was a first round pick of theirs back in 2034. And when I look at the basic batting ratings of Mr. Coma Duran compared to Mr. Heiner, we certainly think that Coma Duran is better like that Luis is durable, don't like that uh, Luis doesn't have the same speed as Mr. Heiner, but he's a very good bunter, and he's actually better defensively, uh, whether as a corner outfielder or a first baseman, than Mr. Heiner is. Low leadership, low intelligence, outspoken personality class, so those things work against Mr. Comaduran. But still think that 
objectively, the profile he has is of a player that we would prefer, despite the fact that he could be a bit of a negative influence in the clubhouse. Now, negatively, Coma Duran is making more money than Heiner this year, and he's arbitration eligible to make around $13 million at this point next year. So we're not really saving any money by bringing on Mr. Coma Duran, but we're getting clearly a better defensive player, and we are getting a guy whose batting rating suggests he should be a better offensive player. But, and here comes the first big but of this equation, Coma Duran has been a below-average offensive player for San Francisco this year. And when we look at what he's done over the course of his career with a 108 WRC+, plus, he actually has not been as productive an offensive player as Mr. Heiner has been. And he's also never hit more than 15 home runs in a season. Um, now, San Francisco is not a great hitter's park. Uh, so I think there's certainly an argument that he could be more productive someplace else, similar to what we experienced last year when we made the trade for Juan Romero from Atlanta. But Coma Duran, with his performance over the course of over 3,000 at-bats at this point, seems to be one of those guys who um, just doesn't really live up to his ratings. That said, though, when I just look at his ratings versus right-handed pitching and where we think he is now, and I compare them to Mr. Heiner's, it's hard for me to not think that Coma Duran is going to be a more productive offensive player for us this year. We know he's better defensively. Um, Heiner has better speed or is more proficient on the base path, certainly. But I think that despite the concerns I have that Mr. Coma Duran hasn't been as productive as Heiner has been over the course of his career and is going to cost more money, when I look at his ratings, when I look at his durability, and when I look at the fact that he's three years younger than Mr. Heiner, I'm willing to overlook the negative personality traits and I'm willing to overlook the fact that he's actually going to be more, more expensive than Mr. Heiner going forward because if it works out, I think he's a better player than Heiner. If it doesn't work out, he's headed to arbitration. The contract isn't guaranteed. We could always... Um, just decide not to make him an offer, which is certainly not my intent if we trade for him. But it's an easier out if things go wrong with Coma Duran than if they go wrong with Heiner. And we were able to also structure this proposal in a way where San Francisco would retain half of Coma Duran's money this year. Um, not going to help us next year when we're up against it in, a, in the budget, but you may remember that we've only got about $3 million available at this point, and we did decide in the 6th, 7th, and 8th rounds of the draft this year to take guys who we knew were looking more than slot. So the fact that we can trade away the... 8 million salary of Heiner and only be paying um, a prorated amount of 6 or 5.9 million um, prorated with them keeping half of it will actually open up, you know, about another couple million dollars that we can use to hopefully sign some of those prospects and bolster our farm system, uh, which I meant to mention with those three top 10 players that we now have is somewhat shockingly ranked as the second best farm system in baseball at this point. So what are you waiting for, old school, you say? 
Sounds like this deal makes total sense. But that brings me to the second but. I haven't mentioned the last player that I need to include for this deal to get done. Because I agree, as it's been explained to you right now, this seems like a win on many levels. Um, we open up money for the draft. We get a player that we think is better. And we get out from Heiner's contract for the next couple years. And we give away in McGaffigan, Trudgeon, and Ainsworth a player, maybe two players, who are marginal roster guys going forward. But there's no such thing as a free lunch particularly when we're dealing with the uh, trade difficulty setting that we're on. So we also have to include Mr. Josh Nagy, who was our first round pick in 2036. Starting pitching prospect who has a real positive personality, excellent stamina, and with his fastball sinker and cutter, three major league quality pitches at this point. going to be 22 years old in 10 days. He was 4 and 6 with a 476 ERA in A ball this year, his third season that he had spent part of in A ball at Marathon. And even though his results were not exceptional, we felt like we had to kind of start trying to move this guy along, figure out exactly what if anything we have with him. So we promoted him to Jamestown a couple of weeks ago where he's 0-1 with a 5 ERA, admittedly over a small sample size of just nine innings pitched. Control has been his issue. Now he does have a high work ethic, high intelligence, high adaptability. We've got great coaching in our minor league system. I think there's reason at not even yet 22 years old that his control can get a little better. I don't think it's ever going to be exceptional. He's going to walk a fair amount of batters. But still looks like a guy who, even if he walks a fair amount of batters, would have plus stuff and plus movement when all is said and done. So I think he is still a pretty valuable starting pitching prospect. And certainly including Nagy in the trade makes this look um, a lot more uncertain in my view simply because ratings wise I think Coma Duran is a better player than Heiner a better hitter than Heiner but his performance on the field hasn't shown that admittedly some of that could be San Francisco but we don't particularly have a great hitting park in Buffalo either but I look at what Heiner has done over the course of his career and over every 162 games 21 homers, 98 ribbies, 280 average, obviously the 114 WRC+. Plus. And I look at what Coma Duran has done. It's 12 homers, 69 ribbies, 265 average, a 108 WRC+. Plus. His ratings tell me he should be a better power hitter than Heiner. But as I said, we've got 3,000 at-bats that don't demonstrate that. And when we look at his batting splits this year, he's pretty much the same guy, home versus road. Four homers at home with a 231 average, four homers on the road with a 236 average, 98 WRC plus at home, actually down to 84 on the road. So that could tell me that um, playing in San Francisco isn't actually even the issue. But I think ultimately, at the very least, we upgrade the defense with Coma Duran. We get three years younger with Coma Duran. And we get out from a contract that's guaranteed for another two and a half years with a guy who's in his 30 and apparently declining in Heiner. And I think my hope is that our scout is right about Coma Duran. And a change in scenery is what he needs. Um, he's unhappy with his performance. He's angry that the Giants stink. Uh, you would think that maybe moving to the best team in baseball could be a nice uh, kickstart for his season. I don't love some of the personality traits. Um, I don't love that um, he's an awful base runner. 
But looking at the ratings, he should help our offense. I mean, even if he has a 92 WRC+, plus, which I'm certainly hoping he's better than that for a guy making close to $12 million, that's still better than Heiner has been for the last year and a half. I don't love having to include Nagy to get this done. But Coma Duran, if he works out, is an important part of our offense for the next few seasons before he becomes a free agent. We get the not awful, but bad contract of Heiner off the books. And I do feel that we've invested so much in drafting pitchers over the last five, six, maybe even seven drafts at this point that we've got a steady pipeline of good young starting pitchers potentially coming up through our organization. We already talked about Jim Lance. We've also got Chris Lott, who's the number 77 prospect in baseball uh, before Nagy at 112, uh, Frakowiak, who we drafted last year at 132, Pat Carmen, who we drafted in the first round uh, this year just a couple weeks ago at 138. So we've got five starting pitchers um, among the top 150 prospects in baseball. Nagy, ranked 112th, is right in the middle of that list. I don't love giving him up. I feel like since it's conceivable, we're only getting a smallish upgrade moving from Heiner to Coma Duran. We're arguably giving up too much having to include Nagy. But as I said, the flip side is that we don't have to deal with Heiner's contract the next couple of years if he doesn't bounce back. And we also convinced the Giants to keep some of Coma Duran's money, a big chunk of it this year, which will make it easier for us to replenish the loss of Nagy and Ainsworth, particularly in our farm system, a bit by hopefully signing multiple guys that we picked in the 6th, 7th, and 8th round by opening up a bit more money. And it also gives us more money to potentially spend over the next uh, month if this isn't the only deal that we end up doing. So if you're still with me, thank you for listening and or watching this long to my ramblings. I'm going to go ahead and complete this trade. Would love to know what you think about it in the comments, but... Um, we have officially moved on from Mike Heiner and Luis Coma Duran. Let's see if he can fit in well with our clubhouse and, more importantly, fit in well in the middle of our lineup. And for those of you who were wondering, uh, Coma Duran was not actually on the trade block. Uh, we just kind of constructed that one organically uh, as we looked at it at the end of the last episode. The Players that were actually on the trade block didn't seem like there were any difference makers. Um, you know, you look at Coma Duran's well-balanced offensive profile, and he seems like someone who should be able to really help us. We're putting him right into the number three hole, playing first base uh, right in the middle of our batting order against right-handed pitching. Uh, not going to play him against left-handed pitching normally. Uh Hopefully, he'll be more productive with us than he has been over the course of his career. You know, I look at those numbers for him as far as his ratings, and it seems like he should be more than a 108 WRC plus player. Let's hope that the change of scenery, and perhaps even more importantly than the move from a losing team to a winning team, the change in stadium will be positive for him and we'll be able to uh, get production out of Mr. Coma Duran similar to the production we were getting from Mr. Heiner four, five, six years ago. And after that major trade, we have now made it to the All-Star Game, uh, five and two record for our Buffalo Wings to start off the month of July here. So as we get to the All-Star break, 65-24 and 24 record, 730 winning percentage. 
Uh, ten and a half up on the Phillies in the NL East. Uh, looks like we are ten. Uh, no, nine, if I could do simple math. Nine up on uh, the Diamondbacks for the best record in the National League. And we are two games up on the Guardians for the best record in baseball. As we get to the All-Star break, Deshaun Seifu with 47 steals looks poised for his 13th consecutive year leading the National League in steals. And our closer, Joe Scott, is tied for the league lead in saves. Don't know. Who is on the all-star team yet? Uh, Seifu generally doesn't get a lot of love. I think he's only a four-time all-star despite a uh, potential Hall of Fame career. Uh, but let's see who's going to be on the all-star team for the best team in baseball this year. And taking a look at our pitching staff, uh, David Espinoza, the reliever, makes it. A uh, guy who came up in our system, third round pick in 2032, 5-0 record with a 224 ERA, over 52 and a third innings as a reliever this year. Our stopper, Nate Ruckel, makes the all-star team. Uh, he's already pitched 83 innings, so um, granted, we're now 89 games into the year, so he's not going to quite qualify for the ERA title, but a prodigious workload uh, for the stopper, uh, who will likely lead the National League in games pitched and holds for a second consecutive year, 293 ERA, striking out more than a batter per inning. And then Joe Scott um, does make it as the closer. 8-2 um, and two record, 25 saves, 2.05 ERA. He has uh, really stabilized that closer position for us since we made the trade with San Diego for him before the 2038 season. He's going to start making some more serious money in the coming years, um, but it is what it is. Uh, none of our starting pitchers, made it this year uh, probably as Patrick DeBonis has pointed out a couple of seasons ago at this point because uh, our strongest candidates may have pitched in the last game or two and weren't going to be available uh, but still three pitchers on the all-star team so not bad there you will see uh, Andres Medina who we waived uh, because of his salary issues um, named an all-star for the Dodgers this year but honestly 214 average with six homers and 215 at bats and a 73 WRC plus. Um, still struggling offensively. Um, but he is named an all star. Uh, taking a look at the everyday players, and we're not seeing uh, many Buffalo Wings. Doesn't seem that we're seeing any Buffalo Wings. So, uh, Hopefully we will take as some motivation uh, the fact that we've got the best team in baseball and the best record in baseball and only three starters and no, or only three players on the all-star team, all pitchers. So uh, none of our everyday players um, named to the all-star team this year. Here at the All-Star break, we're still first in the National League and runs allowed. You can see a dominant pitching staff. And we do rank fourth in the National League in runs scored at this point, although our uh, offensive performance is certainly a bit more varied, which is part of the reason we made the move for Mr. Coma Duran. Obviously an extremely small sample size, but let's see what he's done for us. Yeah, not off to a great start. Two for 17, uh, hitting just a buck 18 in his early days as a member of the Buffalo Wings. But... An extremely small sample size, uh, but we'll check in it again with him uh, probably a few more times throughout the season, and hopefully we'll see that batting average moving up. And as we've been playing coming out of the All-Star break, although Seifu was not named as an All-Star uh, last week, he did get the 2,500th hit of his career. Uh, as we talked about, looks like he'll definitely lead the National League in stolen bases this year. 
uh, with 67 runs, would think that he's going to be in contention to lead the league in runs for the uh, sixth time in his career. Uh, 498 hits away from 3,000 right now. Uh, he's already the second member of the 1,000 Steel Club, uh, but only a four-time All-Star, 28, 29, 35, and 36. Uh, so he hasn't been an All-Star in four years at this point. Um, but he is um, still poised, if he stays healthy, to likely join the 3,000 Hit Club uh, sometime in the 2043 season. And we don't want to be obsessive about Mr. Coma Duran, but checking in on him now, uh, 52 at-bats, two homers, nine ribbies, batting average up to 250, uh, 102 WRC+. Plus. So uh, he's, uh, he's been an above-average offensive player for us at this point, clearly hoping for more than that. Um, might as well check in since we're checking in on Coma Duran, check in on how Mr. Heiner is performing with his new team in San Francisco. And uh, hitting 233, one home or four ribbies. He's also doing better with a 91 WRC plus. Um, but uh, hopefully having um, Coma Duran will help us. Uh, looks like Heiner is unhappy with his performance and unhappy that he's been traded away. Uh, and unhappy that he's on a team that is not uh, 71 and 28. Um, Quick look at the standings, up 11.5 on the Phillies in the NL East at this point. And we are up 12.5 on the Diamondbacks for the best record in the NL. And uh, looking at the Guardians, we're still two games up on Cleveland for the best record in baseball. So it uh, looks like the battle between Cleveland and Buffalo for the best record in baseball over the last uh, nine or ten weeks of the season could be an interesting one. At this point, we're a week out from the trade deadline. Um, Got to kind of figure if there's another deal out there for us. Uh, taking a look at the trade block, um, Derek Bentley is a guy who was not on the uh, trade block the last time we looked at it. Um, certainly would be a guy who could help our offense with that bat. He's in the final year of his contract. Only 45% of it would be coming to us. Um, if the Yankees were willing to give him up for very little, like Mike Goodwin and a B prospect rather than an A prospect, I think he could certainly help our team. Uh, probably will investigate potentially bringing him on board. Other than that, it's kind of familiar names. Dylan Cruz, Nelson Delgado, Browley Diaz, our former players, Gagley and Hardage, have been on the list the previous times we've looked at it. Brad Sanders, Campbell Smithwick, some of these guys that we've looked at in uh, free agency in recent years. So not the um, most impressive list. Um, Dylan Cruz, another guy from the Yankees, um, who could probably help us with his bat. He is wrecked physically. Um, also in the last year of his contract, we've checked in on him before and he's never been willing to um, waive his no trade clause. Um, and we could get him for Estrada, Meza, or Shazir. Uh, certainly not going to do that up front, but the fact that Cruz is at least willing to consider waiving his no trade clause um, might be someone to consider because I'm guessing he'll be a little less expensive than Mr. Bentley. Actually, Mr. Bentley, um, I don't know that we'd give any of these players straight up for him. Um, but he actually seems like he's a little more reasonable to acquire. Um, so definitely could be something for us to think about. Don't know that either of them moves the dial incredibly for us. Um, but we are committed to trying to do everything possible to win it all this year. So we're going to investigate that. Uh, pitching wise, Jeff Dover has been the prize. Um, he's been on the trade market this whole year. Not, uh, 
the reason I don't think we have a player that makes this deal work is that Dover's got a $32 million contract. Um, so in addition to them looking for a lot from him, um, he's also more expensive that we could afford. If they keep 80% of his contract, well, then we can get it done. Uh, but we'd have to give up um, the th three players we talked about earlier. We'd have to give up one of our top 10 prospects. Uh, to be able to bring Mr. Dover on board is a rental um, for a couple of months. Certainly has a profile that could help us win it all. But at this point, um, we've got the best pitching staff in baseball. And you can see all five of our starters have ERAs in the threes at this point. Um, certainly Dover, as far as a front end number one starter, would be an upgrade. Uh, but for the price we'd have to pay to bring him on board, I don't think that's the direction I'm inclined to go. I think we've had really good pitching for many years now. I think trying to give our offense a boost if we're going to do anything on the trade market um, is the way to go to try to find a little more offense. And we may try to get an updated scouting report on Derek Bentley before we have to make a decision. Um, it's kind of weird that we've been playing this game and investing a ton in scouting. And for some reason, a guy who's been in the majors for 11 years, we only have average scouting accuracy on him. But would love to get that better if we can in the next few days. Um, he's having a brutal year for the Yankees with a 71 WRC+. Plus. So it's possible that at age 34, he's just completely fallen off the map. Um, don't love potentially bringing in another guy with some negative personality traits into our clubhouse. But I do think he could be an upgrade over Goodwin if we could somehow um, get some value um, for Mr. Goodwin. Um, now, obviously, Goodwin is not listed as someone that they would do the trade straight up for. Um, the only reason not to move on from Goodwin would be uh, that, as some of you remember, he was the only um, captain personality we had since um, when... Damari Hainsworth um, was moved out of the closer role. He lost his uh, captain personality. But the reason we could move on from Goodwin um, is that I think it's certainly an upgrade defensively, um, probably an update upgrade with the bat, definitely losing a lot on the base paths, getting rid of Goodman. Um, and then Bentley is a more negative personality compared to the great personality of Goodwin. But our um, ace, Alexis Mendoza, oh no, that's not our ace. I get confused by the Alexi. Our ace, Alexis Barajas, has developed um, a captain personality, which I just noticed when I was... Um, trying to figure out whether we could afford to lose um, Goodwin's um, captain personality. And because of that, um, if there's any value at all in Goodwin for Bentley, I think we could afford to do that. Um, as I said, Bentley's certainly an upgrade defensively. I think he's an upgrade with the bat. Um, not as fast and not as good an influence in the clubhouse but still net net is probably a guy who on the margins would help us um, a little bit in terms of trying to win this year. And we have gotten the scouting report back on Bentley and uh, it's not as good in terms of his profile as it had looked. Um, still a pretty useful guy against left-handed pitching. And as I mentioned, um, still definitely a better glove than we see from Mr. Goodwin. So again, I don't think I give up any of these important major league players and or top prospects for him. Um, 
I don't know what they're going to think about us putting Goodwin in the deal. Um, I'm certain that putting him in a loan uh, says we're close. How close are we? Actually, it does look like there's a few other players who could make this work. Um, so I'm going to investigate that. Uh, I don't think this is a revolutionary deal, but I do think on the margins, um, swapping out Goodwin for Bentley, as I said, upgrades our infield defense gives us a bat that certainly has a little more power um goodwin does have the batting average up to 202 but still a 58 wrc plus this year bentley 208 but a 70 wrc plus because he at least has 10 homers and 366 at bats um It's a very marginal trade, um, but I'm still going to investigate it a little further. And we've got a deal constructed that will bring us Mr. Bentley. Um, as I said, I'm just envisioning him as a bench player who starts against left-handed pitching, uh, but upgrades our infield defense if we have some injuries. Um, honestly, a big part of the reason that I'm doing it is we were able to get the Yankees to keep the remainder of his contract, which opens up a little more money for us to try to sign two, if not three of those minor league, uh, of those players that we just drafted. So, um, I think it helps the team a little bit this year, but similar to the trade for Coma Duran, it also opens up a little more money for us this year, which we can use to sign those prospects have to give up Goodwin, which as we talked about, we're fine doing. Kevin Taylor um, is a 29-year-old minor league pitcher in our system. Uh, we had him in high A ball this year where he's been pretty good, 11-2 and two with more than a strikeout per inning. But this was a guy who was a borderline major league roster guy with our pitching staff. We don't really have any need for him. Probably can help on the margin. Um for another team. And then Doug Floyd, a 23 year old who was a 15th round pick, um, pretty much just organizational depth for us. Um, 10 saves this year in Class A marathon, but not a big time prospect. So happy to include those guys um, to get the deal done. So we're going to go ahead and complete that trade. Our experiment with Goodwin is over. Um, players are a little leery about uh, Derek Bentley in the locker room. Hopefully we can keep things together. As I mentioned, we are down at this point to... Um, actually, I, wanna, I can look at team chemistry here, which is still um, pretty solid. But uh, we have added an outspoken player in Coma Duran. And then as just noted... Um, the players also have some concerns about Bentley. Uh, but when I do look at our roster, I uh, mentioned that Barajas is a captain now. And when I look at leadership, um, we've still got a lot of guys with high leadership, a few with low now, um, and with Coma Duran and Meza, two of them are guys that we've brought on um, over the last six or seven months. Um, work ethic, a lot of guys with high work ethic and nobody with a low work ethic intelligence um coma duran and shazier a little low but we've still got some um high intelligence players on the team as well um loyalty a couple negatives and then greed also a couple negatives but a lot of positives so on balance it still is a clubhouse and a roster that has more positive personality traits than negative uh, but certainly with the addition of Coma Duran and ultimately um, Bentley when we put him on the team. Um, not as strong personalities in terms of positive personality traits as uh, we had in the past. Definitely uh, could be a situation where um, some of those strong personalities cause us problems. And we can see that... Uh, Bentley does have that disruptive reputation, um, which may not be optimal. But hopefully his performance on the field will make up for it. It's hard to imagine he's going to be less productive than Goodwin was.
which is kind of the same reason we made the trade for Coma Duran. I don't know if these things are going to work out or not, but um, just looking at the profiles of these players, I think we've made the team better. The issue is, have we um, caused some issues in the clubhouse that are going to come back to haunt us? And as we head into the last couple days before the trade deadline, uh, we've been checking who's available and thinking about our team. I kind of think we're getting close to done. Uh, we're still up double digits in the NL East, uh, ten and a half on the Phillies, even though we are only four and six over our last ten. Only one game's up on the Guardians for the best record in baseball, uh, but we're still. Looks like 11 and a half up on the Diamondbacks for the best record in the NL, which actually means that uh, the Phillies are the closest team to us. So uh, 10 and a half up on the Phillies for the best record in the NL as well as the NL East. So I um, feel pretty confident we're going to have home field advantage throughout the National League playoffs. Um, I'd love to add a guy like Jeff Dover, but the price is just too high given that when we look at the team statistics, we are a dominant pitching staff, um, still fourth in the National League and runs scored, still kind of middling in a lot of the uh, different metrics. Granted, we've had the two additions that we've made, not for an extended period of time, uh, Derek Bentley's played just one game for us, went one for four um, since he's only starting against left-handed pitching, and he's only been with us a couple of days. Um, taking a look at Coma Duran at this point, and uh, he's been struggling since the last time we checked in, hitting just a buck 91, two homers and 11 ribbies and 68 at-bats. Does have six doubles, uh, but when you add it all up, a 64 WRC+. Plus and a uh, below replacement level type of performance was uh, not what we were looking for when we uh, picked him up. And we've thought about some position players, uh, notably Brad Sanders, Kadir Notice, Zach Foster, and Dylan Cruz, who we had already talked about. Uh, but with what these guys are at this point, I don't really see any of them moving us the direction that we need to go. Kind of a similar situation with the pitchers. Um, Dover would be great to add. Um, the price is just too expensive. Looked at our old friend Cameron Johnson, who we seem to uh, try to pick up as a rental every couple of years. Um, we could bring him on board, but... I think he struggles to improve even the back end of our bullpen. Um, and he also hasn't been particularly successful in Buffalo the couple times that we've had him in the past. So I'm going to keep trying to scrounge something up offline. But I think I'm likely to be back uh, in a matter of moments to you, kind of letting you know that we... Um, have moved on and uh, moved past the trade deadline. And as I anticipated, we are back. We are past the trade deadline, and uh, we didn't do anything else. I really explored Jeff Dover, uh, but for a two-month rental, as much as we are a win-now team, uh, the price was just exorbitant in my mind given that um we've got a really good pitching staff the way it is um so the hope is that an upgrade or a potential upgrade at first base with luis coma duran and a potential upgrade at your utility infielder spot with Derek bentley uh, will be enough to uh continue this team on the strong path that it has been here in 2040 uh, as we begin the month of August, 76 and 31 record, 12 and a half up on the Expos and the Phillies now in the National League East. Seifu, a couple months away from leading the NL in steals. Alexis Barajas, uh, third in the National League in wins, 
Joe Scott leading the National League in saves. Uh, taking a look at our team stats, still a dominant pitching staff, and we have improved one notch to third in the National League in runs scored, um, but still feel like we might be getting a bit lucky there. Our 640 winning percentage in the month of July was the worst winning percentage we've had this season for a month, uh, which puts into perspective uh, just how great a season it's been thus far for our Buffalo Wings, and uh, hopefully it will remain that way as we finish up the last couple months of the season. Uh, as I talked about, in addition to the trades that we made, I do feel like there are some guys in the minors who could certainly certainly help us in September, and at least one of whom, in the case of Contreras, we're hoping may be able to also help us in October. Uh, and we'll find out how the rest of the regular season goes in our next episode. Uh, the goal is certainly to maintain the best record in baseball and uh, to ensure that we're healthy when the postseason begins. We are three games better than Cleveland at this point for the best record in baseball. And at this point, we've got nobody on the injured list at the major league level. So um, maintaining that three-game lead for the best record in baseball. And uh, if we're able to do that and ensure that all of these gentlemen here are still healthy when we get to the end of the regular season, uh, we'll have done our job for the last couple months of the season. Would love to know what you think of the trades. As I said, I don't think either one is revolutionary, um, but hopefully they both help us. And we do now have five and a half million dollars um, now that we're past the trade deadline to hopefully bring on uh, a couple, if not all of these prospects. Um, onto our roster or uh, into our organization which will also on the margin hopefully help us um, for many years to come with the little bits of money we did free up in both of the trades that we made until our next episode thanks so much for watching and hope you have a great day